Um, before we jump into layer three, I mean, this lab is going to be next week. Now, the reason why we have this, we're covering the topics at this rate is because we're going to be hitting a couple of holidays. I think the July 4th is a Monday, so in that case, you know, we don't have the luxury to have a lab. But also because we want to have enough time to take a written exam, for example, that's going to happen during class time. So at some point we're going to reach, we're going to pair again the, the lab you're executing that particular week with the, the lecture itself. I mean, right now we're just trying to introduce the topics um, that will allow you to basically focus on the last for the next week, week and a half. So on Monday, uh, Levi will cover NAT path access list, which is basically connecting the network to the internet. Today, I'm basically trying to glue together the wireless, the wire lab, and the introduction to IP routing protocols and a little bit of IP addressing. The essays over the next two labs, they're going to be working with you on your IP addressing to make sure that you can get it down to, again, a couple minutes, learning some of the tricks about subnetting. And, and again, the lecture is going to focus more about the purpose of our routing protocols, why do they exist, how do they learn information, and the quiz today was a lot simpler. I mean, we're, we're going to give you the topics for the quiz, so you're not so surprised, and also you don't get overwhelmed, overwhelmed with the amount of reading that we have to do. I mean, still try to do the reading in the background. Um, piece of advice, you don't read as engineer. As engineer, you want to make every line count and make highlights, everything, and make notes. Take a quick spin, you know, literally. Go through the whole chapter in 10 minutes just to try to get an idea of what, what are they talking about. And then later on, do it again and just increase the level of detail. But don't try to read it page by page and yeah, this command and let me make a note. It's impossible. There's no way you're going to be able to cover the materials that quick, okay? So, let me continue a little bit on the wireless lab. So, um, when you work with Levi, he focused more on the layer one and the characteristics of the radio environment and some of the rules you have to follow when you implement a wireless network. There's one slide there. In fact, let me see if I can pull it up quickly that I may consider important from the practical perspective, which is going to be... This is a slide. So, you know that you can have multiple flavors of 802.11. So what's the main difference between the early flavors of Ethernet and the latest one, the wireless Ethernet that you see in the market and the ones that you see today? What's, what's new about, you know, 802.11n or AZ, that's a, is that the last one? Okay, so what's, what's, what's the difference from the... But higher data rate, how, how can they achieve higher data rate on the same frequency? MIMO, which is multiple input, multiple outputs. I mean, they just put a bunch of extra antennas to use multiple channels at the same time for one user. So your radio components are changing, but at the end of the day, it's just using more channels at the same time. There's one small difference there as well, which is that so first of all, the, the wireless net networking has been evolving to a selfish approach. All the bandwidth for me. I mean, it's been built for the users at home that, you, you know, bandwidth hogs that, you know, I want to download, I want to stream. And I don't care about a wireless network that connects 50 users. I care about one that connects two. So that the, the, the re reasoning behind MIMO is like, yes, all the pipe to me. Okay? So that's why you know, these protocols have evolved. But it's still the frequency is the same. The spectrum allocated was the same, okay? So just remember that not necessarily because you have a faster network is going to perform the same way when you have multiple users. Another subtle difference, difference about AC is that AC starts to behave more as a switch. A, B, G are typically more a hub. Everybody listens, everybody can sniff your data because everybody's using the same frequency. Once you go into N, you have MIMO, and you have multiple antennas. So potentially, one antenna can be talking to customer one, and another antenna can be talking to customer two. So in that case, two different frequencies, they don't overlap with each other. Okay, so you can have two, two, two 
laptops connecting full duplex to the access points and getting their own conversations. And that is the transition also into AC. Yes, multiple channels, but still the intelligence on the access points and the receivers will allow them to have multiple users talking at the same time. So officially, I cannot call them a switch. Why? Because if you, have an, you, if you are an AC access point and somebody has a B receiver or you know, the NIC on your laptop is an older generation, then it has to work as a broadcast, as a typical broadcast system. So that, that's just things from practical perspective. Every time you want to upgrade the access points, you need to incorporate the fact that all the users should be able to talk at, at the same technology or use the same principles than the access point itself. Otherwise, if you just you can buy a very fancy access points, but you have a cheap user with an older laptop, game over. You just threw away all that money for for a very basic Edo 211 hub setup. Okay, just things to remember. So, congratulations, you have access points. So now the question is, how do we connect them to the network? What are the options you have? Do we connect all of them to the same switch? And in the same switch, same VLAN? Yes, no, why not? I mean, this is not perfect science. There's going to be a case for every single, for every single scenario that I'm going to present to you. But let's assume all of them connect to the same VLAN. What is the purpose of that? Same as SSID, which is convenient, not necessarily secure. Well, let's, not, let's not make encryption. Let's talk about the user. Let's talk about connectivity and usability for now. Yes. Roaming. So you don't change, remember, you don't change the IP address. You don't have to reset your port number. If you're watching a movie and you move from one SSID to another, second authentication, you need to get a different IP address, different DHCP. The server that is streaming the movie sees you as a different user and it will try to play the movie from scratch. So yes, roaming is going to be one. The second one is going to be coverage. So like here in campus, we have a bunch of antennas with the same SSID, UCB guest, UCB wireless, and just scatter all of them around. What, but what about this classroom? Let's assume we, we're able to see that a lot of people in this classroom. Are all of you going to be served by the same access point? Because in that moment, we're not talking about, you know, again, this is engineering, this is business school, this is law. So there's no overlap between them. What about having all of you in this room? How can, what, what tricks can you play with using Nero 211 technology that will allow you to keep the customers more happy? So in this case, for example, we can have one access point working on one channel, another on the different channel, and another on a different channel. Same area, same SSID, but three different frequencies. Why? Because the idea is for you to maximize throughput. And all of them can still connect to the same VLAN on the back. But in this case, you're actually manipulating the radio, radio environment to maximize throughput. This is going to be very typical when you have like conference, conference centers. I mean, you go to Las Vegas to one of those, whatever your favorite event is, you know, how can you make everybody happy you offering free Wi-Fi in a room that has 10,000 people? How can you build a wireless solution? By the way, this is not going to work in that conference room. How do you do it there? More access points, but it, I don't know if you notice, let me go back a couple slides quickly here. How come wireless indoors has a shorter range than outdoors? How come wireless stinks more inside than outside? Let me put it. What is multipath? She took the wireless class. Yes, that's right. That's not fair. Okay, let me translate that one. Okay, so you have an access point here. Not all, all the radio signals, not all of them get absorbed or get through the wall. Some of them are going to bounce. So if you have a laptop here, you're going to get a signal directly from the access point, but also you're going to get one that bounces through the walls. Okay? So it would take a look, a very simple, if we want to send a very simple, simple bit 
the one that is directly line of sight is going to be like that square. That's the bit that you want to transmit, right? But then the second one, the one that bounces, bounces from the wall, is going to come a little bit later because it took longer distance, right? And then another one is going to come a little bit later. So what happens? The bit is not this small anymore. It's wider. So therefore, the amount of bits you can send in the air gets reduced. I'm oversimplifying the reasoning, right? But at the end of the day, it's, it's one of the reasons. You cancel each other. Some of the signals actually mix with each other and basically make your data useless. So indoors, you have the challenge that you know you don't know how the radio environment, how propagation is going to be. Those who took the wireless lab, you have to study the materials. You have to make the map that you specify. OK, this is cheat rod. This is glass. This is this. This is that. And then put the antenna and let the software figure out. OK, you have to place the antenna on this corner. You have to tune the power level to this amount, because just going the maximum power is not going to help you. You can cancel yourself. You can shoot yourself in the foot. So you can have to tune it down to whatever a proper level is suitable for a particular room. Not only that, a lot of the access points, once you're going to enterprise great access points, the antenna is something that you buy on the side. And the particular type of antenna will depend on the beam that you're trying to send. I mean, it, on one side, you can buy an omnidirectional, which is you know the same signal, same strain in all directions. Or you can buy a directional, the one that you can put in the corner and makes a couple of cones. Right? Or you want to do Wi-Fi across the freeway, you buy a directional antenna, literally a dish, and you just basically make a very long leg. You know, a lot of reach, low bit rate, but it still doesn't go away more than you know five meters on each direction. So you can manipulate the radio environment for you to your advantage. Not all the time Wi-Fi wi is just used to everybody just connect to the access point. Sometimes it's just to extend a point-to-point -point wire between two different routers, and that might be actually, I mean, in the mountains, it's easier to run two antennas between two sides of a hill than running, running coax or cable or fiber to the middle of the woods all the way, dig them out, and so on. So think that about wireless and more about an extension of the network, and as a way for you to replace the cable. So going back to... I don't know if you're familiar with cellular towers, you know that a lot of the antennas do hexagons, right? Right? And then you have all these honeycomb patterns, and then the frequency you use here, frequency one, frequency two, frequency three, and then you use frequency one again. So again, if you have a conference center, you can play this way. You actually use different frequencies, and basically on the roof of this room, you put directional antennas that just beam down. That's the way you will do a high-density conference center. You just have antennas on the ceiling, and then basically you honeycomb the floor with antennas that only work up. Okay, that's if you want to do it correctly. You can always go cheap, put an antenna in the middle, and broadcast and drop the bit rate down to kilobits per second. That's an option. But again, the customer, the amount of money, how sensitive or how important the traffic or the service is, will determine how much money you put into wireless. Okay, you can always have all these access points covering the same area. However, each one of them connects to a different VLAN, VLAN 1, VLAN 2, VLAN 3. This is what you're going to see in hospitals. You're going to have one VLAN for voice services, voice or IP services. You're going to have another VLAN for all the tablets and your records and so on, encrypted secure. And you can have another VLAN for guests. And again, all of them is the same space. They might actually be part of the same frequency. Like in the lab, you're going to learn how to split one radio interface into multiple SSIDs. You don't need to have one port per wireless VLAN. You can use one radio and just split into multiple SSIDs. Yeah, you're going to pay efficiency price, but you're going to save money. And you can do this, again, with three different access points or one access point that just emulates three different users. Okay. Um, again, once they're connected into the VLANs, it's up to you to decide where to take them, and that's what we're going to cover today. Once you're connected to the switch, what's the next component? You're always going to hit a default gateway, right? And now, by the way, before I jump to routers, you know that you can have an access point terminated, sorry. Ah, the eraser doesn't work. 
you can have an access point terminated here, another terminated here, and you can trunk, right? So you can have access points in very diverse locations of the build and still be part of the same VLAN. One thing I forgot to mention on, on the switching part, so what's an SFP or what's a GBIC? Anybody has an idea what an SFP is? What are those little things? So in the, some of the switches, you're going to find that there are some, I mean, everything is copper Ethernet, in most of the case in the lab, but you're going to see some of these universal ports. And then depends on what you inject there, you can basically have another copper port, fiber port, and so on. The reason I mention this is that because the type of technologies available on these components, on these plugins, can range from, you know, 100 meters to 50 kilometers. You don't have to, you don't need a router to have a network. You can have a whole inter-campus or inter-building conversation and still keep the users on the same VLAN. Like here in CU Boulder, there's no need for us to go all the way to a router, make a U-turn, and then come back to, to you know, business school or even to go to East Campus. There's no need for you to actually touch a network or hire an ISP. There's so much, the technologies for over fiber are so extensible that you can ex, you know, keep your layer two end to end all the time. So you don't have to actually touch a router, just fiber the heck out of it and the distance is no longer a limitation. Yeah, if you want to go from here to downtown Denver, ah, we might be pulling in close, but you, you can rent a dark fiber Instead of hiring two ISPs, one on this building, one in another building in downtown Denver, just rent the fiber itself, put the proper optics on the endpoints, and then you have a network. And it's your own network to manage. Same IP address, same subnet. If you, want, if you buy one PDX or voice over IP server for the whole campus, or even one firewall, instead of buying a firewall per building, buy one centralized premium, and then funnel all the data from all the different departments into a particular building and then do all the filtering there. Okay, if there's one building too far away, yeah, buy a VPN service, but get all the data back into your headquarters and then do all the filtering and all the security in one spot. One IT shop, one security shop, one professional engineer. And that's a lot of the things companies are doing today. You go into a, a, an hotel, for example, yeah, they have internet access, but in reality, that internet access goes on top of a VPN to a centralized data center where they do all the filtering and all the commercial stuff and then they connect you online. Okay, so just remember layer two is not necessarily copper base, 100 meter, same building. Once you go from one building to another, game over. We have to use routers and go to an IP cloud. No. You can layer two, you can abuse layer two. Use and abuse layer two to full extent just by manipulating layer one, using layer one. And guess what, as I mentioned, there might be a freeway here in the middle between two buildings. Use antennas, do wireless. And they don't have to be 11. You can actually pay money for an actual license, get a real frequency that has no interference. And that, those devices are still gonna receive ethernet frames, transmit them, and you're gonna get ethernet frames back on the other side. In some of the slides I mentioned, 900 megahertz, like baby monitors and all this stuff. Why is that? The lower the frequency, the easier it will go through materials. So sometimes it's good to drop a little bit the bit rate, but be able to get through concrete walls, rather than just be, try to go very high, which you know is gonna bounce or it's not gonna get beyond a particular wall. And all that is just radio, okay? But just remember, from a networking perspective, it's just a connection between a switch and a switch. Take advantage of all the layer one technologies available so you can actually extend your network in a convenient way. Don't try to fiber the heck out of it or ISP the heck out of it or lease line the heck out of it. There's no need to do it, okay? So, Oh, 
pam 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 So that was on the wireless. So what's going to happen this week? Well, I mean, again, I mentioned yes, I mentioned Tuesday. You're going to have an 1800 router, which in reality is a combination of a router, a bridge, a switch, and two access points. Okay, that's the 1800 router. Let me see. So the real challenge of the lab is trying to keep your mind, remember all the times, what am I configuring and how does this device connect with the rest of the world, okay? So again, this is gonna be interface .11 radio. The same way you do interface ethernet or interface point to point, it's just gonna be interface on the router. What happens if I do interface .11 radio 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3? sub-interfaces. We're actually splitting one physical port into multiple logical ports. So you want to offer a lot of SSIDs on the same interfaces, you're going to break that physical port into multiple SSIDs. That simple. Then you have to decide, okay, somebody connects to the radio, do they touch the router directly? You can do that. How do you touch the router? Well, you put an IP address here. If you put the IP address on the port, as soon as you put the IP address, you connect the router component. What if I don't want to put an IP address here? I want the router to be some other router in the company. Remember, you go to a switch. So what you're going to do in the lab is basically le learning how to bridge, as I mentioned, 802.3 wire Ethernet with 802.11. You create a bridge group. You say this SSID connects to this VLAN on the switch. Once you create that bridge, any user that connects to the access points is able to ping anything on the switches here. Any other computers? And be able to reach a default gateway that is somewhere else in some different device. For that, you're gonna use what is called BVI, a bridge virtual interface. Okay? And there's gonna be another scenario there that you're gonna try this week, which is, okay, well, it might be that this router, we, we might actually put the IP address on the BBI. And we put the IP address on the BBI and we run DHCP, we give away IP addresses for the wireless users, but also give away IP addresses for the wire users. Okay, but still, one thing that you always have to keep, keep, keep in mind is at the end of the day, all the networks have the same format. You hit a layer two technology before you hit your default gateway. Just keep that in mind and you know which pieces you have. And by the way, there can be wireless users that never hit a router. I mean, there's nothing preventing you from having a switch and having a laptop connect to a server. Here, you don't need a default gateway. You can have a VLAN that is only used to talk between those two, those two devices. This is gonna be true when you have a data center or a, or, or a VM that connects to a database. No one from the internet needs to access it. It is just an application to application service, two boxes doing a back-to-back -back data exchange. And at that moment, again, you don't need a router. No, it's not going to go online. Not all the networks require a default gateway. Okay? Fair enough. So, going back to the model, right now we are very, uh, we're trying to get familiarized with the fact, okay, one user, one layer two technology, one router. But when you try to build this for fault tolerance or for higher capacity, what do big players do? What happens if now I have a server? How can I minimize single point of failures? I mean, the server model is not gonna be one blade anymore. You're gonna have multiple servers that are gonna be part of your VMware platform. You know, you separate the application into multiple actual physical boxes, right? Your hard drive, you don't have only one hard drive per server. You're gonna have a SAN or a NAS 
you know, network-based storage, which is a hard drive that, you know, if you have multiple redundant disks and you can have multiple ways to connect there. So that's the IT side of the redundancy part. But how, what about the network? What do we do to keep the network redundant? Or to not have a single point of failure on the network? What do we do? Here we're gonna see multi-homing. You're gonna have multiple links coming off the server. You can ether channel out of the server to a single switch, another ether channel here, right? Then, let me go back to the pen. So, then again, this is access sometimes. You have distribution switches. What do you do there? Oh, no surprise. This is going to be very, very typical deployment in any network environments where they have an SLA and they want to keep the network alive. You're going to be multi-home to more than one switch. The switches are going to be multi-home to more than one distribution. But then what happens when we hit the router? What happens when you hit the default gateway? We still need to hit the router to be able to route. What do we do then? The challenge we have is that whenever, sorry, I'm not going to move. <laughs> when we have a router, the only golden rule when you have a router is that every interface on the router, this is interface one, interface two, and interface three, the only rule that you, can, you have on the router is the same IP address or subnet cannot be on two ports. You cannot have the same network on one side of the router and the same network on the other side of the router. That's the golden rule. It has to do with subnetting and all the IP addressing design. So how can we, we cannot do this because we're gonna have two different, the same IP addresses on two different interfaces. How can we, not even with our interfaces, because you have the same IP address, the server has the same IP address. You cannot have the same IP address show up on two different ports on the router. That's the reason why HTTP is being covered. It's not on the CCNA books, and it's, the only reason we add that is because, okay, what's the principle of HSRP? The idea is to have multiple routers. We start with, let's start with two, to keep it simple. So we're gonna have two routers that connect to your switching infrastructure, right? That eventually connect to your servers that are multi-home. But now the question is how can we make two physical devices look like one logical default gateway? And it can be more than two. You can have two, three, four, five, right? But the idea is the same. All this has to look like one router that has one IP address, which is gonna be the default gateway for your computers to go out. So how does HSRP works? Virtual IP, virtual MAC address. So every router is going to have a physical, a real IP address and a real MAC address. But then you're gonna configure what is called a virtual IP address. The virtual IP address is whatever IP address is gonna be the default gateway that you give away to the computers through DHCP. Remember the information that we give through the HTTP? This is your IP address, this is your mask, this is your DNS, and this is your default gateway. So that IP address gets done dynamically. So how does HSRP work? You enable HSRP in two or more routers. You configure the IP address that all of them are going to serve. But then all the routers have to compete with each other to see who becomes the active. Same process, comparable process of what we saw in in switching, somebody competes, somebody wins. Hidden HSRP, somebody competes, somebody wins. Next week when we do OSPF, they compete, somebody wins to distribute the data, the, the LSAs, okay? So, so there's gonna be a competition. One of them is gonna become active, the other one is gonna be standby. You're gonna learn how to configure this, again, HSRP configuration, you define the HSRP group, you define the virtual IP address, you define the interface where you're going to run that 
feature. I mean, obviously, in this case, you're going to run it in all the ports that are part of the same network, that are part of the same. The default gateway can only be accessible to all these four interfaces in this case. Right? So, how do you pick the, the best one? Priority. By default, HSRP runs default priority of 100, which means that if you don't touch HSRP priority, who's going to become the active node? Highest IP? If the priority is the same? Is it the highest IP or is it the first one who turns on? Okay. Highest IP is only through the OSPF. In this case, no, highest IP address doesn't, doesn't matter because you can be dot two and I can be dot five. If you put it first, you become the active node. And when I come in, there's no way I can take you off unless you configure a command call preempt. Preempt is just an extra feature on HSRP that tells you, okay, if I go away for a second because I'm getting an update or they're changing my configuration, well, you're doing all the job. As soon as I come back, you should hand me over the control of our that IP address. I have to be the default gateway again. Okay? There's another f command that you add to HSRP, which is tracking. At the end of the day, these two routers connect you to the internet, right? What happens if this link goes down? And this guy has a priority of 200, and this guy has a priority of 100. Do we want to send all the data to the default gateway that goes nowhere? How do we fix this? Because even if the routing protocol changes, remember, this is one device. This is, has one IP address, so the routing protocol doesn't know the difference between two different HSRP nodes. So you're going to be tracking that interface. You track this port here. If that interface goes down, one of the parameters in tracking is basically how much do I drop my priority? So you're going to do drop it by 110. If that link goes down, my priority becomes 90, and then anybody else on the HSRP can take over from me. They tell me, hey, you have a better priority now. Get out. So the key in configuring, configuring HSRP is trying to know, okay, how much do I have to decrement for? And again, this can be very complicated because, well, this can be, become far more complex. I just want you to get the basic understanding and the basic execution of HSRP. But you're going to see that some companies connect to the ISP with more than one link, more than one fiber, because they do load balancing. So they might lose one link, but not the whole three or four. So you don't have to decrement the whole thing. You can just drop a little bit and you know be more granular in terms of when do you concede or hand over to the other HSRP. Okay, so HSRP at the end of the day, one of these guys has the IP address. So what happens when a computer gets an IP address from the HTTP and now it tries to go to the internet, right? We try to go to google.com. Remember, you have to ARP. Where's my router? Who's my default gateway? So ARP is only replied by whoever is active. Whoever is active controls the IP address, and he's the only device authorized to reply with the MAC address. In the quiz, there was a question about gratuitous ARP. When is that even needed? Our gratuitous ARP is basically when somebody advertises his MAC address without being asked. So what happens when this guy goes away and this guy takes over? The problem is all the switches have the MAC address pointing on those ports, right? When you check the MAC address table, you see that to get to the router, this is the exit interface. So if the router dies, when are the switches going to refresh the MAC address table? Let me clean this a little bit more. 
so it makes more sense. I have one switch and I have two routers basically, right? And right now this is my default gateway, virtual IP, virtual MAC. It's called virtual IP.1, virtual MAC is .a. Right now on this switch here, the MAC address table says to go to .a, go out and interface fast Ethernet 1. If this router dies, or this link dies and he concedes HSRP to the other guy, still all the packets that show up from the switches, from the computers, are going to be sent based on the MAC address table. Switches don't understand HSRP. They don't understand if you're routing, if you're alive, if you have a routing table, if you have a different, they don't have a clue. They only care about the MAC address. So how do we assure that the switches don't black hole the data? Because the switch is still going to send the data all the way there, even though this is the guy who has network, network connectivity. How do switches learn or how do switches update MAC address tables? Incoming packets. So gratuitous ARP basically is, hey, if I know I'm the new HSRP guy, I'm going to transmit a dummy packet. Nobody asked for this. I'm just going to transmit it out, saying, now I'm the owner of A. As soon as you do that, you poison the MAC address table of the switch, or your multi-home, multiple switches. So now the layer two infrastructure knows where the new default gateway is. Okay? So that's the reason why Gratitius ARP exists. Just to refresh the information available on the switches before you hit the router. Yes, Gilbert. So remember, we're talking about the virtual ones. The virtual one is the one that is doing all the work. You still have the, your own physical. If you check the MAC address table of each port on the router, it's still that one is unique. The IP address of each router port is still unique. The only things that are virtual are going to be the default gateway and the MAC address that is used for ARP to the computers. So if you're a computer here, you can still ping the router, but that router is not your default gateway. The default gateway is whatever virtual IP address you have, you have created, okay? So, so in my, at the end of the day, a very basic network, I have a computer and, and two routers. How many IP addresses are we using right now? We have one IP address on the computer, one IP address on the physical interface of that router, another IP address here, and another one that is going to be the virtual IP address, the one that is basically HSRP between these two devices. So we're using four IP addresses already just by having one computer, two routers, and turning on HSRP. Okay? Now, HSRP is part of the family of what is called first hop redundancy protocols. HSRP is Cisco specific, but if you use a different flavor of networks or vendor, you're going to use VRRP, which is the same logic, the same behavior. In fact, in BRRP, you can bundle more than one device, more than two or three devices. You can have just, there are very subtle differences there, okay? What's the downside of HSRP? Tell me why HSRP is a bad idea. Give me just, why wouldn't we like to have HSRP? Well, but let's take away the proprietary nature. What's, what's something, every, every time they ask you what's a downside, think about money. Well, no, no, think about money. Yeah, if, if this is active, all the data is going this way, and here you have a lot of money doing nothing. Congratulations, you have redundancy, but. So when you go into interviews, they're gonna tell you, oh, we don't do HSRP. We do enhance HSRP or HSRPE, blah, 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 blah. What they do is they configure two default gateways. So you're going to have a DHCP server that basically gives away two pieces of information on the same network. Hey, you're part of the 10 network, 10, 0, 0, 0, slash 24. 
if the one computer shows up, they tell you, oh, your default gateway is 10.0.0.1. 10, 10, if another computer shows up, they tell this guy, oh, no, your IP address is 10, the default gateway is 10.0.0.0.2. Then what they do, they run two HSRP groups. This guy is active 4.1. This one is active 4.2. This is a standby for dot two. And this is standby for dot one. So half of the computers pick one router, the other half of the computers pick the other router. Both of them in the same subnet. Hmm? Um, it is getting closer to GLBP, yes. I'll mention GLBP quickly, but but now you see how we do load balancing with SRP. So it's the same subnet, one user, one set of users, but we want to use both devices on the way out. That's how they do it. I'll give you another way to make this efficient. Right now we're talking one color, which is red, and red can be VLAN 1. You can have another VLAN, VLAN 20, and you have computers here and they can, I mean, this interface no longer access. Now this is a trunk. 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 So now one VLAN, you can configure this so one VLAN goes out on one router, another VLAN goes out on a different router. You're going to put the HSRP on the sub interface or on the VLAN port that touch the router itself. Okay? This is what you're gonna be doing in the midterm, by the way. This is the midterm. I'm giving you like half of the work on the midterm itself. You basically integrate, you're gonna do in this wireless app, you're gonna play a little bit with HSRP, how to turn it on for one VLAN. But when we do the midterm exam, you're gonna learn how to do it for multiple VLANs. And I'll tell you, this device is the default gateway for you. VLAN blah, blah, and blah. And this is the router that's gonna be the default gateway for this, this, and this. But if this guy fails, the other one can take over. You mentioned GLBP. GLBP works a little bit different, but the only thing I want you to remember about GLBP is in GLBP, you can put as many default gateways as you want and all of them share the load. You configure how much percentage of that load is being shared by all the devices. The beauty of GLBP is that this can be a very pricey router, this can be cheaper, this can be even cheaper, and you can adjust the load balances according to the capacity of each router. When you do HSRP or BRRP, all the devices have to be exactly the same capacity because you don't want to die and hand over to the other device and that guy is dropping 50% of your traffic. Okay? So in HSRP, BRRP, you have to be linear. You have to be equivalent all the time. Not only that, you have sometimes to have the ability to handle all the traffic for all the users with a drop in package. So you're still putting money on the table that you're never gonna recover. But that's when QoS comes in and you can say, well, if this guy dies and all the traffic goes here and he's a bottleneck, you can choose to drop VLAN 1 because these guys are just guests doing web browsing and we keep our operations up and running. You can add that that ability to select which traffic is important and what to get dropped. But that's QoS, okay? Again, HSRP. So now we have redundant all the way to the default gateway. So what's the next part? Which now, congratulations, you hit the router. What happens once you hit the router? Let's go back to a very simple network diagram. We have a computer, switch, and a router. Simple, redundant, whatever way. At the end of the day, we got into the router. So what we're gonna cover today, we talk about routing protocols, which is basically we have to exchange information before we actually hit the actual internet. Okay? And before we actually do NAT. NAT is gonna be covered next Monday before we translate public IP address to private IP addresses and vice versa. How do we get outside of the enterprise? Routing protocols, okay? So, at the end of the day, what is the function of the routing protocols will provide?
how do we build that network map? It can be very easy. Every router tells each other, this is the VLAN that I connect to. This is the subnet that I connect to. And this is the mask of the subnet that I connect to. This guy will tell me about the networks he connects to, and this guy about all the networks he connects to. All that information gets collected into the routing table. Once you have that map, every single IP packet that is not local, right? Because if it's local, you talk directly to the computer. You never bother a router for traffic that is just between two users on the same network. That's given by the mask. But when you have to go to a router to go to a different network, now the router has the information about, okay, where do you want to go? Let me check my map. Do I have a match? Go out on that interface. So this map here is gonna say, to go to this destination network, go out on this interface. Right? To go to all this other destination network, go out on interface one, or go to interface two. It's the same principle we saw in switches. In switches, you're going to go to this MAC address, go on interface X. You go to go to this MAC address, take this trunk, and go on, on this interface X. It's just the same thing. It's just the same principle, just the way you populate the data is a little bit different. Okay? So, we're gonna talk about the specifics of writing protocols because there are some tricks here about how do we build a map. Let me give you a couple scenarios here. So this, net, this router connects to network A, this router connects to network B, and in the middle we have network C, right? So this guy is gonna tell this guy about network A. This guy's gonna tell this guy about network B. In the case of RIP, you, don't, you not only say that information, you tell all the information that is in your memory. Hey, I know how to get to B, but also know how to get to A. What's the problem with this? What's the problem about another router telling me information that I generated? Loops, why? Because if this network goes down, this guy doesn't have a clue how to get to network A. Suddenly, the neighbor tells you, I know how to get to network A, give it to me, right? The bucket goes to you and like, okay, where do I get it? Oh, I have to give it back to you. Okay, so loops are possible in writing protocols. The beauty of IP packets is the fact that you have TTL. Every time you, an IP packet goes to a router, gets decremented, decremented, so if a packet gets lost, it will die. In switches, we don't have TTL. You make a loop at layer two, that pack is gonna be running there forever, forever. And the only way you can, so what's the way that you remove a broadcast loop, a layer two loop, how do you? How, how do you remove the packets that are looping in constantly? Because this is gonna happen if you have a spanning tree configuration or sometimes a lot of the loops in the spanning tree happens when you cascade too many switches, you know. Right now your topologies are one switch away or three switches away, but when you have a lot of different switches distributed, multiple buildings, right? Like think about the campus, they put one switch on each building and run fibers all over the places. Sometimes when the route fails, by the time the message goes into the other side, there's already another route and some port is being open. Sometimes the time it takes to reconvert, we're talking about one minute, Sometimes one minute is not sufficient to send the update all the way to the other switches and make a decision. So it might be that two claim to be the route that two open blocking ports and a layer two loop is possible. So how do we get rid of the ethernet frames that are not dying, that are in loops? Pull the cable and let the frames fall down and then plug it in again. Now, you're gonna to have to break it physically. You have to literally pull the cable to kill the physical loop. That's gonna be the only way the packets are gonna die, okay? Why? Because sometimes the packets 
because the packets not die every time you transmit a packet, it will just keep, it, keep it, filling it up, filling it up. So you're gonna if you have a 10 gig switch, you're gonna be running 10 gigs of dummy data that eventually take away the processing power of your switch. You're not gonna be able to console into some of the switches sometimes. All you're gonna see is the flash in light. And no console access, no responses. You have a layer two loop. You're gonna have to pull cables and restore them, okay? So going back to IP packets, how do we prevent about receiving the information that we handed out to our neighbors? Before that, there's another one. Now before that one, you're missing one. What is a split horizon? The information I give you, you shall not give back to me. That simple. That gets rid of the problem that I, this guy should not tell me about network A and this guy should not tell me about network B, right? The problem, split horizon doesn't fix all the problems. Why is that? I tell you about A, he tells about A, he tells me about A. I never send you A. That doesn't break a rule. So split horizon will not protect you ab about in indirect advertisements. So you might say, well, I'm, if, I, if I connect to A, I can just reject A. And nobody can poison me. But don't forget that sometimes there are multiple paths to the same network. So even if you lose your wire, you should be willing to take a route that connects you back to the same resources. So you don't have the luxury to say no. Okay? So how do we fix this? Here's where route poisoning comes into the picture. What is route poisoning? If my network goes down, what, what will this guy do? You change colors. Well, in the case of RIP, you make the network, you still advertise the network. You're still gonna advertise A, but you're gonna say the hop count is no longer one hop away or one router away, it's like 16 hops, meaning A. I'm still telling you that I, doesn't, I mean, this network is no longer reachable. And then what's the second step of poisoning? Hold down timer. These two work together. Basically you say, hey, the network is gone. And then you cover your ears and say, I'm not gonna learn anything for the next 20 seconds or for the next minute. Actually three minutes in RIP, something like that, right? So for three minutes, I don't, I'm just la 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 By the time that I remove my hands, if somebody still claims that they have a route to the destination, that means that they know how to get there. But I'm going to let my protocol tell, I'm gonna tell my neighbors this route is crap. Then I'm gonna wait for them to have an opportunity to tell their neighbors that the route is gone and their neighbors' neighbors, okay? So that's why I'm doing the hold down timer. Why? Because after three minutes, I give enough chance to the protocol to advertise everything to all the neighbors. Even by the time that I, the hold down timer is gone, I can remove my covers. If somebody else still has a valid route to A, that means that that route does exist, then I can add it to my routing table. Okay? Route poisoning, hold on timer, split horizon. Are characteristics of what type of routing protocols? Distance vector. What is distance vector? Routing by rumor. Meaning, I only learn information from my indirectly connected neighbors. I don't know how this neighbor got the information. It could have come from myself, from two or three devices. At the end of the day, you just tell me, I just trust what my neighbors are giving me as information. Okay? That's one flavor of writing protocols. What's the second flavor?
how does link state protocols work? Link state, what is link state? So in link state, we're talking about a database. All the routers build a database, and that database will have every router and every link. You don't tell me how to get there. Just tell me what you connect to. And tell me what you know about your neighbors and what they connect to. Don't, don't, don't do any calculation for me. Don't, don't change the information. Don't tell me you know how to reach network A. Either you own network A or you know someone who knows who owns network A. But don't tell me you own something that doesn't belong to you. Okay? That information gets distributed to something that is called LSAs. You're going to see those in detail next week. Once you have a database, you can basically have a whole map. Hey, we have three routers, router one, router two, router three. And router one is connected to network this, this, and this, 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 and this, and two, this, this, and three. Once you have the whole map, then you run shortest path first algorithm. So before you even send an IP packet, you know exactly which hops it's going to take, which wires it's going to use, and there's no way you're going to have a loop. The trade-off here is obviously you have to have more memory to keep the database. You need to do more processing to calculate the shortest path on a per route basis, per destination basis. The beauty is that you don't have to do any of this. Because if it, in this domain, if you lose a route, it might take all the way to three minutes before you can actually send packets again. Here, as soon as a link fails, advertise an update to the database, all of, everybody recalculates, and they know exactly if the packet is dead, sorry, the network is dead, or there's an alternative pack. Okay? So link state versus distance vector. The only downside of LSAs or, or, or link state database is the fact, what happens if this link is going up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down? Because, because it can be a microwave link that it has a sandstone in the mid middle, or it can be a fiber underground with a farmer trying to dig it out, right? Or it can be an appealing cat five cable for a rat in New York. You know, whatever reason takes your route down, you can do a denial of service on the routing protocol by forcing it to recalculate and recalculate and recalculate and recalculate. There are some ways to protect the routing protocol from flapping routes, you can basically penalize it, okay, I'm not going to treat you seriously, less seriously, and so on, but at the end of the day, the fact is that's how you abuse a link state routing protocol. Okay? Now, there's another problem with link state. The more paths, the more permutations, right? There's going to be a limit about how much an LSA protocol can do. Because suddenly a change on LA is affecting calculation of your routers here in Denver. So how do we address this? You're going to see that this week. In OSPF or in ISIS, which is two of the protocols that do link state, you're going to see areas. Areas means that you have different databases. You're going to have one database for Denver and changes that happen in Denver only. You're going to have another database for Miami and all those routes in Miami. And then you're going to have an extra database that connects Denver with Miami, but only cares about the whole major block of IP addresses, not the small subnets that you have on each device. So you, that's the way that you will scale the use of OSPF. Because when you do distance vector, you don't have that problem of scalability. You just receive information from five neighbors. You only care to keep track of five users, and all the information shows up to you. And in fact, the internet today runs on distance vector. BGP is a distance vector protocol. So for those particular cases, yes, distance vector is, is a more suitable option. You don't, we, again, why don't we use link state? First of all, we don't, want, I don't, we don't want a user pulling the cable on the walk of the jack 
making all the errors in the world recalculate, recalculate, right? This is mostly already on the side, so I'm going to go to slides pretty quickly because I'm trying to just explain this with common sense. And I think this is far more easy to understand why before, instead of me going through all the different rules. So, do you want to take a 10 minute break? And then we'll skim to the slides. Okay, let's do 10 minutes. Enjoy, enjoy. You're not even, just eat normally, don't worry about it. Hey, still awake? Still bringing water, still bring coffee, you know. Chai, at least. Okay, I'm gonna start. I'll, I'll catch up with the other two students later. So, quick review about IP addressing. And again, we go back to I'm not going to go to the binary. I mean, that's expected that you're going to go with the essays about the, re the binary behind it. Um, but still, if we take a look at one IP space, you know, 10, 10, 10, dot zero slash 24. How many computers are we talking about? 254 users, right? Where do we get the 256 from? Remember, we have eight bits on each one of these bytes, right? And then how many combinations? Two to the eight combinations? 256. Now, are you comfortable if I state that a single slash 24 splits into two slash 25s? But what am I doing here? What happens when I grab a particular mask? Not gonna move. What happens when I grab a particular mask of 255, 255, 255, zero? What are the masks that we're going to use on slash 25? 255, 255, 255.128. Again, what is, why do we even care about splitting IP space? The mask is the same, right? Is it 128 or 127? 7, 0 to 127. 0 to 127. So what's the mask? So is it 127 or 128, the mask? Okay, then, so what is the argument? It still is the same mask, right? So why, why, why do you even bother about IP address efficiency? Again, are you going to burn 254 addresses every time you make a network? If you have one VLAN with two printers and a copier, are you going to burn a whole slash 24 just because it's in a different VLAN and it's accessible to all the users? I mean, when you talk about private IP space, you have the luxury to do it, but even in large enterprises, private IP address is not sufficient. So they have to be very granular in the way they manage IP space. If you work for an ISP and they manage public IP space, they care about every single IP address they can get. In, in actually in, in Comcast, they have about three people, full-time employees, that all they do is subnetting. That's a full-time job. Just trying to evaluate all the customers, how much IP addresses they have, and all you have to do is propose new IP addressing schemas. Hey, I gave you too many IP addresses, you're not using those. 
I want those back. And I'll change your mask from slash 24 now to slash 25. You don't need 256 addresses. You, need, you can manage with 128, okay? If we take a look at this from a circular perspective, that's my method, which is pizza, right? You have a whole pizza of 256 addresses, right? You want to cut it in half, how many IP addresses do you get? 128, right? From zero to 127 and 128 to 255. If you start from zero, you go all the way to 255, right? So that's 256 addresses. From the binary perspective, all the numbers here start with a zero. Go from zero, 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 zero to zero, one, 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 one. This is 127, this is zero. And all the IP addresses on this side it starts with one, zero, 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 zero. That's 128 and goes all the way till 111. So you can see it from the binary perspective that when you create a subnet, they have to look the same. The network number has to be the same. And this is the reason why a router will tell you this IP address is invalid or this IP address overlaps with the other interface because the router essentially makes sure that the network number is not, do not overlap. If we slice the pizza into four chunks, now four chunks of 64, all the IP addresses here start with zero, zero. All the IP addresses here start with zero, one. One, zero, one, one. You can do the binary to figure out, convert any IP address on that range. But you know why the router cares about which 64 values you pick. Because just because the pizza, you cannot slice that into chunks of 64 like that. You cannot go from 32 to 96. Those IP addresses cannot be part of the same network. In the decimal world, they will. You know, they still have 64 IP addresses. I should be able to use anything on that range. No. It goes back to the binary. So even if you slice an IP block into smaller chunks, you're restricted about which chunks you can use and which values you can use, okay, all the time. So just remember, there is a binary reason why members of the same subnet look the same way and are identified by the subnet number the same way. You were to split this into eight chunks, again, go back to binary. Now, zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one, zero, one, 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 zero, one, one, one. Binary combinations, okay? So, what about the minus two? Remember, we have eight bits. We have eight bits, which is two to the eight combinations, which is 256 combinations, but we can only use 254 addresses. First IP address is the network number, right? The last one is the broadcast, okay? Now, remember, the network number doesn't have to be a zero because if I'm the, begin the first number on this slice of the pizza, it's gonna be a 32. If I'm the first value on the slice of this pizza, it's 128. So in the midterm, I'm gonna ask you IP addresses. So I'm gonna ask you questions. Say I have 10, 10, 10 dot 128 slash 26. Is this a valid IP address or not? And the only way you're gonna be able to know the answer is to know exactly, okay, is 128 a host IP address? Or it might be a network number. It is a network number, right? But unless you know the, do the math or you do the pi, there's no way you're gonna be able to get that done. Right, or I can say, okay, let's assume I have 129 and 142. Can they ping each other? Are they part of the same VLAN? Yes. yes. 142 and 160. Okay, so you can see how easy it is for me to build questions for the midterm without just by playing with the, your decimal brain. But why? Because your brain thinks in decimal. And two values that look pretty much next to each other 
Oh, yeah, they can ping. They're part of the same network, but not. The, the computers won't forgive you. The RF won't forgive you. So you mess up the mask. You put the wrong mask. On, let's assume on one port you put a slash 25, but on the other interface you put a slash 24. The RAR will complain, hey, this group overlaps with this one, because you're trying to tell me that this IP here that is part of the whole pie is, doesn't overlap with the IP address that I have on this half pie, right? Because still at the end of the day, this is 10, 10, 10, 0, slash 24, and this is still 10, 10, 10, 0, slash 25. We're still talking about this half versus the whole pie. If you make that mistake, the router will tell you. Now, the router will tell you when you try to configure this, configure this on two interfaces on the same router. You'll know exactly, hey, this overlaps with the other one, fix it. But there's always the case when you configure the slash 25 here and the slash 24 here. In that case, you're not going to get a warning. Nothing is going to fix it for you how are you going to know that you have overlapping information? The routing table. Here's what sometimes when you ping, you get replies, and sometimes you get a timeout. Because you get lucky, you actually hit the slash 25, but if you're not, you don't hit the slash 24. And on that slash 24, half of the IP addresses exist and the slash 25 they don't exist. So you have to be careful because you mess up your IP address and there's going to be an effect either directly connected or in networks that are, you know, learn from other routers themselves. Okay? So taking a visual take, I mean, so which mask am I using here? Again, get used to it. 24 is equals to two slash 25s equals to four slash 26. Okay? Slash 27s. Slash 28s. Again, just visualize the fact that every time you move the mask, every time you make the mask larger, the number of holes is less. You cut it by half. Okay? So you went from 256 to 128, to 64, to 32. If you need 33 IP, 33 IP addresses, you have to go all the way to 64. This is a binary world. You're always going to have to go to the next binary number. So some of the things you have to account for, okay, what happens if I need a network for 64, well, for 62 computers? What mask should I use? 26. Why? Because 26 gives me 64 minus 2, 62. The problem is you forgot about the default gateway. How are they going to get out? Right? And you have HSRP. It's two IP addresses. And you want to tell it to the switches that connect to the users, that's another IP address and another IP address. Okay? This is a trick I'm going to play on the midterm. This is you need to account for all the IP enabled devices that you want in a particular network. Okay? Again, no shortcuts here. I mean, no shortcuts here, okay? So Again, when we break the, okay, let me take this example here. So this is the IP block 10, 10, 10, dot zero slash 24. We split in that 24 into two slash 25s, and then each 25 into each slash 26. So we have four slash 26s, right? Number one, number two, number three, number four. Tell me the network number, tell me the network Tell me the network that identifies each one of these four slices. Which one is going to be the first one? That's the first one of that pie. What's the first IP address of that pie? 
Every time that I give an IP block in the midterm, in the exam, I'm going to give you the whole slash 24. And we're going to ask you, okay, you need to have four networks of this number of users. You're going to have five networks of this number of users. It's going to look like this. You're going to have a big call center with 100 employees. You're going to have a, a accounting office of 32 employees. You're going to have point-to-point -point links between the routers. You only need two IP addresses there. So you need to be able to basically segment the IP block according to the needs of a particular scenario, okay? So let, let me give you an, an easy one. You have a single slash 24. You have 16 users, 25 users, 45 users, 60 users, 20 users. Which mask are you going to use on each one of them? Or how many bits do we need for each one of them? Because that's the other thing. If I have, if I have 80 users, which mask do I use? How many bits do I need? I need 128. 128, how many bits is 128? Seven. Seven bits. That means that 32 minus 7 slash 25 will do it. That's another way to calculate it. You can, go the, you can count the number of hosts and take it away from the 32 bits, or you can learn the 24, 25, 26, 27, and understand how many host bits are left. Okay? Two ways you can do the same thing. For 16 users, you know you need an IP address for the default gateway. You're going to need 32 values. For 25, you're going to go to 32 values. For 45, you're going to go to 64. For 60, borderline 64. For 20, and then you have three point-to-point -point links. Two IP addresses, two IP addresses, two IP addresses. But ideally, it's going to be four because of the minus two rule. Right? So you have the whole pie here. You can make it very easy. So let's do 64s. You have four options here. You can pick any one of those 64. There's no rule here. I can pick that one, and I can pick that one. This is going to be accounting. This is going to be sales and support. Then you need three chunks of 32. You have four left. You can pick any one of those. You have inventory, inventory, delivery, manufacturing. And then you have all this space left to do three point-to-point -point links. And here, how many chunks of four do we have? We have 32 addresses. There are eight. So you can pick the last one, two, three, four. Doesn't matter. So now the problem is now give me the values that each one of these networks will have. Let's pick this one, sales and support. Sales and support is this network. What is the first, what is the network number for that one? Class B with a slash 24. What's the class B IP address? 130000/24 for example right so what is the network number what is the ip space we're going to use on that department one twenty eight what mask are we going to use there slash twenty six what is the first ip address you can configure on that network 129, that's most likely going to go to your default gateway. That's going to be the one you're going to put on that link there. You're going to do 130000 slash 26 or mask of 255, 255, 255, dot. What's that 26 when you type it in? 192. What's the last IP address of that network? What's the last one here? Again, what's the first one here? 192, take away one. That's the broadcast address. So what's the last IP address you can assign to the computer, sir? See, you have all the information needed that you're gonna need when you configure that port. If you are gonna create a DHCP pool, you know exactly which IP address you're gonna give first and what's gonna be the last one. You know the mask they're gonna give away. So IP address is gonna be the building block for all your network solutions. Inside here, you can have switches, you can have VLANs. That doesn't matter. At the end of the day, you're still going to hit a router, and you're still going to have a default gateway. And the IP address of that default gateway is going to happen. It's going to come from this place.
why did we double the users? Actually, it should be slash 23. What's the slash 23? If you know that one slash 24 is one pizza pie, right? And one slash 25 is half of a pizza pie, the other half of slash 25 is the other half of the pizza pie, what happens if I give you slash 23? Two pizzas, if I give you slash 24. Four pizzas, if I give you a slash 21. Eight pizzas. I'm not gonna move, sorry, I forget, I don't have to move. So, in this case, the ISP is giving you a slash 23. So, I'll give you the IP address. Okay, it's gonna be 130.10.10.0 slash 23. What is the value, what is the value of each one of the complete pizza? Which are the values that you can use? I'll make it more interesting. I'll make this one a nine. 130.10.9.0 slash 23. That's the block the ISP gave you. That means that this is 130.10. Again, this is binary. You get zero and one, two and three. So which ones are these two? 8.0 slash 24. This is going to be 130.10.9.0 slash 24. Think about it. Each, each slice is 24. You have to know which numbers belong to each one of them, right? No? Okay, let's do it with math. What is a mask of, two, of 23? How do you write that one? 255, 255.254.0. .255 That's the mask that you type in. What is the magic number? 256 minus 254. It's a magic number of two. Multiples of two before we reach nine. Zero, two, four, six, eight, ten. So nine is here, it's part of eight. Zero and one is one network, two and three is another network, four, and, I mean a slash 23 network, six and seven. See, everybody is very happy when we go slash 24 or less, but when we start going bigger, game over. And this is something I'm gonna abuse on the midterm, why? Because you have to start thinking about big networks. Slash 24s are useless on data centers, on any colocation site, and any call center. You don't have only 200 employees. Once you get into VM, VMware, one server can consume a thousand IP addresses, one cluster. I mean, forget about having just the convenience slash 24 and 192, IP addresses that you give on the Wi-Fi hotspots. You start, need to start thinking of how to build big networks. So, so supernet, it's called supernetting, basically going backwards on a particular mask, okay? So anyway, that's what IP space do we have? 130.0.8.0 slash 24 and 130.0.9.0 slash 24. Those are the two pies. Users times two, so now 32 users, 50 users, 90 users, 120 users, 40 users. Going all the way to the binary, 32 users, we need 64 IP addresses, 50 users, we need 128 or 64. With 90, we go to 128, 120, 128, 40, we go all the way to 64. So now, how do we assign the two pies that we have. Well, two chunks of 128, 128, half and half. This is accounting, this is sales and support. Then you need two chunks of 64. You have four here to choose from. Pick any two you want. Delivery department, manufacturing. Actually three chunks of 64. Inventory control 
and we still have a lot of IP space to do the three point to point wires. Yeah, this is just getting used to the procedure. I mean, the math will come with reputation, okay? But I, just, I want you to be able to associate, okay, I need so many users, so many subnets, how many blocks do I have, how do I slice it? I'm done. One more try on this one. Slash 22, now I have, five, I have four pizzas. So what's the IP address? 130.0. Dot, let's just assume 50.0 slash 22 to make it more complicated. So tell me which is the number on each one of these pies. What's the mass for slash 22? This is the block the ISP gives you. The ISP just gives you the whole block. You have to figure out how to use it. So what is the mass for that one? 130.0.50.0. What's the slash 22 mask? 255, 255.252.0, 256 minus 252, 4. That means multiples of 4, all the way till 50. So we can do times 10, we have 40, 44, 48, 52. So 50 is here. So 1 is dot 48, dot 49, dot 50, dot 51, 130.0, 51.0, dot zero, slash 24, 130.0, dot zero, slash 50, dot zero, slash 24, dot zero, slash 24, dot zero, slash 24. Yes or no? If not, this is what I want you to ask the essays at the beginning of the lecture. After you do the wireless, I want you to focus on this. As soon as you start writing, you need to get, this has to be mechanized in the next week, in the next two weeks. You need to be able, you need to be comfortable visualizing IP blocks, not only slices of a pizza, but also multiple pizzas, okay? So again, two times the users, two times the networks. So here we have 32, but also we have another one of 32. We have 50, another one of 50. Here we have 90, and another one of 90. Here we have 120, and another one of 120. And here we have 40, and another one of 40. You already know, 120 goes to 128. 128, and again, that's you can leave these two for sales and support. And then you have another two for 128. You can leave these two for accounting, accounting one, accounting two. Then you need two chunks of 64 here. You can have those two for manufacturing and you have two for delivery. Then you have two chunks of 32 IP addresses, actually goes all the way to 64 because of the default gateway. So again, you use another two here for inventory, inventory, and you still have half a pie for the three point to point links. And you already know exactly which IP address you're gonna configure on the default gateway on each one of these NICs, the mask you're gonna be using, and the first assignable IP address, and the last assignable IP address. I know some, some of you are like getting the eyes like this. Which part is, do you think is the most difficult? Which one is the part, which is the part that you think is more, is harder to understand? You need to start learning to ask questions because usually I don't get any questions until after the midterm. Yes. Yep. The dividing the networks in the dots from the dot 50, how you are doing that? I know you are doing the method, but how are you choosing dot 40, dot 40, or dot? Because remember, even if you go, even if the mask goes on this direction, 
we're still constrained by binary limits. Okay? So if you if I give you slash twenty two, how many slash twenty fours do we have? Well, how many bits do we have to play between these two? Two bits. How many combinations do we have? When it's zero zero, zero one, one zero, and one one. So we know it's gonna be groups of four. When I give you slash twenty four, a slash twenty two, you're gonna have four slash twenty four. Which ones are those? Well, one is going to start with zero, 0, in the binary. The other one is going to start with zero, 1. The other one, 1, 0, and 1, 1. So the question is, okay, we know these fours are coming in. So dot 50 belongs to which four? That's when we go multiplying 4 by 4 by 4 by 4. It's not 0, it's not 4, it's not 8. Go all the way to 40, 44, 48, 52. And I know, okay, 50 is part of this 4. And these are the 4 that have to be part of each other. Okay, that, that it is, same happens. So this, this same principle happens when you do summarization. You have all these routes on the writing table, and your mission is to reduce the size of it. Which ones you can aggregate together? Which ones you can consolidate and advertise as a single route? My point is, so here, let me go back to this. You know, so let me make a small point here. We know that in the last scenario, I show you that all the accounting, for example, can be done accounting, accounting, and perhaps all the sales and support can be done like this, sales and support. Ideally, you want to keep accounting and sales support on the same piece of, the same pie, so you want to advertise one route out. You can advertise the whole slash 24 out and tell everybody, anything that is part of this pie, send it to me. It's one route out. However, if you assign one account in here, one account in here, you know, one sales and support here, and these sales and support, there's no opportunity for you to consolidate route or to summarize. You're going to have to advertise all four routes individually as slash 26. So IP addressing subnet allows you to maximize IP space, but you pay the price when you build the routing table. When you build the, route, the map of the routing table, for every subnet you create, you have to advertise a route. You make 20 subnets, you're 20 routes on the routing table. Okay, and, and as ISP, they have the same challenge. ISPs have to sell one IP address to this company, 20 IP address to this company, and so on. So if there is a subnetting nightmare, the question is how many of those routes have been advertised to other ISPs in the world? Some companies advertise one whole prefix. Everything that starts with one slash eight, give it to level three. And that makes the writing table far more efficient. But as companies start merging with each other or some companies give, sell their IP space to other domains, then it becomes just a nightmare. I mean, that's, why, that's the reason why the writing table of the internet has 50, 750,000 routes. You cannot do show IP route enter. You're gonna wait there a lot of time. So once you get into a job into an ISP, you need to learn how to do show IP route only for this prefix. That's the number one command you need to learn. So you know exactly what you're looking for because there's no way you're gonna be able to tab and tab and tab and tab and tab and tab and tab for. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, all these guys need is okay. But remember, this this is slash 24. At the end of the day, let's assume it's going to be 10, 10, 10 dot zero slash 24. That's enough information for these guys to know where to send the packet. Once he reaches that router, he knows exactly how to use this cable, this cable, this cable, that cable, because he's directly connected to three, four different slash 26s. Same principle that we use on a default route. At your house, you don't have a map of the whole writing table. You just have a cable modem that says, just give it to the ISP. That's enough information for your modem to just hand it over to an ISP who has the whole router, the whole map, and they know exactly how to take you to the rest of the world. Same happens inside your routing, inside the campus network. A router here in engineering doesn't know the way on the, to all the routes on the internet. All they know is how to get out of the school through a default route. Once you hit the front, the, 
the gateway of the firewall, then you go and connect to an ISP, and that's when you talk PGP. Okay? So it is the same principle. You know, try to reduce the size of the writing table whenever you can. Okay? Now, there's a flip side of that. Having a very universal route also means that if you have multiple ways out, you don't have the ability to load balance between all the links because only have one piece of information, so all the data goes out on one port. And sometimes if we have multiple wires between two different routers, and you want to make sure that one subnet doesn't, doesn't compete for the pipe with another subnet, another subnet, you don't want to accept the slash 24. You actually want each one of them to be advertised individually, and you change the metric. So accounting one goes here, accounting two goes here, sales and supports goes here, sales supports goes here. So in the lab, you're gonna learn how to turn on the writing protocol. Writing protocols you turn on with two commands. This flavor, advertise this network, you're done. The second part of the lab allows you to influence the writing protocol. Hey, let's make this route a little bit worse. So it takes this link. And let's make this link a little bit less appealing for this route, so it doesn't get picked by shortest path first. So this is the extra components of the lab itself where I want you to manipulate and control fully how the protocol behaves. Because turning it on is pretty straightforward. Two commands and you're done, okay? And this is one of the cases when summarization is not desirable. Also, it's not desirable when you have that network, that network, that network, but this IP address doesn't belong to you. It belongs to this other router. You can also create problems when you advertise a network that is not part of your summary. It's meaning you have four slash 26s, but only three of these are in your router. This one belongs to some other router. You actually make a problem for the network when you advertise all these as a slash 24 because you're claiming that you own that slice of the pie, and that's not true. So what happens when somebody trying to ping them, the packet is gonna show up in your router, and it's gonna die, okay? So there's a chance for you to black hole data if you just become too generous. So in this case, if you only own three slash 26s, the only way you can summarize properly, you advertise one slash 25 and the 26 alone. Okay, so but that's a great question, by the way. So, 10 minutes for writing protocols, 15 minutes for writing protocols. We already talked about making a map, right? Static routes, you're gonna start the lab by doing static routing. We're talking not the lab this week, just a, just a writing lab at the beginning. Static routes, you're gonna learn how to hate them by making, it's a very simple network, it's four routers, but you're gonna to have to type the whole map manually. It's the same way on a MAC address, on the switches you can type all the MAC addresses. To go to this MAC, go on this port. Go to, to go to this MAC on this port. However, you also will appreciate the simplicity of having static routes. You don't need a fancy routing protocols when you only have one or two ways out of your network. When your topology is linear, there's only one way that way then use the static routes. Makes sense for you to use them at some point. Once you have start having multiple redundant paths, that's when the dynamic protocol becomes appealing. But if your network is linear, like you have a tree topology type of network, you know, doesn't make sense to have a writing protocol. There's only one way out of the tree. But as soon as you have redundant paths, boom, then you use dynamic, okay? So, some of the tricky terminology, there's a difference between routing protocols and routed protocols. Routing is RIP, OSPF, is BGP, is what exchanges information. Routed protocols is IPv4, IPv6, anything that you run on top of the router. Okay, so just be careful. When we talk about link state and distance vector, we talk about a database, we're still talking to the neighbor. Protocols that use inside the company, protocols you use outside of the company. Again, this is BGP, this is the rest. Autonomous system, when you configure some of the writing protocols, they ask you for to specify an, an autonomous system number. Basically, it's who owns that network. So in the case of BGP, every company has a different AES number. CU has its own, has its own AES number, Level 3 has its own AES number. So all the routes 
that they advertise they have their AS number on them. We know who generated that route. And that's the way internet is being protected nowadays. Every network that it gets advertised has the name of the person who, adver who made that advertisement. So somebody is spoofing or somebody is claiming to own IP address that they don't own, we can call immediately the guy who is advertising that route. Okay? We talk about building the writing table. Yeah. You learn and propagate, right? But what happens if two routers tell you they can reach the same destination? Again, let's do a very basic diamond network. Network X is being advertised to you by these two guys. Which one do you pick? You can put the first one to show up. You can pick the one with the best metric, right? Or you can draw balance. There's one command there that is called maximum paths that allows you to have multiple entries on the routing table. So you receive two routes to the same destination from the same protocol with the same cost. You can load balance between both of them. You don't have to reject one or have idle links because you just pick one route at a time. It is possible to do that. If a route goes away, take it off. How soon will eventually differentiate one protocol from another? And if you get a better one, you change the link speed or you know you have a new wire, a new port, a new interface, the protocol has to be smart enough to to select the best path. However, you're gonna learn when we talk about RIP, you only count the number of routers. So what, what's the problem with RIP? You have these three routers with 10 gig interfaces and a cable modem, oh, a dial-up, so 64 kilobits per second. Which route is going to be picked to go to network X? My point, you might say, well, RIP is stupid. Why do we even have RIP? Go back to the years with routing. Well, all the network speeds were the same. Everything was dial up at some point. So when all the layer one, layer two technologies had the same speed, RIP made sense. And then you can see, well, how do we fix RIP? Well, then you see the transition. Then EIERP or IERP was invented by Cisco. And Cisco has like five metrics, delay, MTU, utilization, you know, and so on. They just put too many on there. And then the industry said, well, we win something that is not vendor specific. Let's invent OSPF. So, I mean, see those protocols in a evolutionary sequence, then a lot of things clicked in. But still, that doesn't take away the fact that if all your networks are 10 gig, you can still run BG, you can still run RIP. It is a very simple protocol. Restoration time, again, we talk about link state, poisoning, you know, doing all the hold on timer. Again, subtle difference between the protocol and the cells to prevent loops. Again, you know that link state protocols don't have loops by design because every router calculates the shortest path to the destination in a loop-free environment. All the loop prevention features eventually cost you time, and you're going to find those in distance vector protocols. BGP. Again, we're going to scream to this. The only main difference about BGP is that it uses TCP. You're exchanging 700,000 routes, even at 10 bytes per route. I mean, it's how many bytes do you think is, so a route on the writing table, how big do you think it is in terms of memory? You have a network, a mask, a cost, an interface. How many bytes is an IP address? Four bytes. How many bytes are the mass? Four bytes. Next hop, even the IP address of the next hop, another four bytes. So even if we talk 100 bytes per route, times 750,000 routes, how much memory are we talking? One gig of data or one meg of data? Do the math. So in that case, you don't want to send it over UDP. You want to make sure that it's reliable, it's a file transfer, so that's why you're gonna see TCP being the protocol of choice in BGP. 
Everything else is multicast, unicast in nature. You got the information, great. If not, wait for the next update. Okay? We talk about AS numbers. Every ISP has their own number. We know exactly who built a route. The only, uh, you ended up taking the class of IP routing with Kevin, Professor Epperson. The only thing you need to remember in BGP, everything is based on money. OSPF, RIP, all the protocols inside the enterprise are built for efficiency. Shortest path from A to B. In the internet world is which one is cheaper? Do I make money out of you? If not, why should I give you my premium links? Why should I put your traffic on my 10 gig backbone if you don't pay me a penny for it? No, use my best effort routes that go all the way and bounce all the way to Kansas City and good luck. Okay, so it is business driven. Okay. Every ISP has a number, so when your route jumps from one ISP to another ISP to another ISP, every ISP puts their name on it. So in this case, it came from 22, then to two, then to one. So 22, two, and one. Okay, so every single ISP puts their name on it. So if the route gets advertised back to you, remember the problem we had in RIP? Somebody else advertised your own route. In this case, has your number, has your name on it. You can reject it. You know exactly it's your information. That's how loop prevention happens in BGP. Very simple. But you carry more information in every update. That's it. So you can have the simplicity of distance vector and still have a very viable way to prevent loops. Okay? Without running a database of all the routes in the whole world and trying to do things state like OSPF. We're going to talk distance vector, link state, hybrid. We're going to talk about it later on. You can sell the whole routing table or only send an update when the network fails. Your choice, send the whole file transfer over and over or only send an update when a link goes down. The metric changes from hops to speed. Classes versus classful. Now you know that an IP address without a mask it's hard to determine if you're talking about a big network or a small network. When you don't transmit the mask, you default to the mask of the class. If it's an IP address of 10 something, it's a slash eight. If it's a 130, it's like slash 16. If it's a 182, 168 something, it's a slash 24. Okay, so transmitting the mask, even though it's more overhead for the protocol, gives you a better perspective. Oh, this is slash 26 is this way. This is slash 24 is this way. This so transmitting the mask makes sense. Distance vector logic, where we talk about that, I'm just gonna skip through it. But any questions, we open next week with those, okay? Repression one, repression two, IGRP, link state protocols, OSPF, database, advertisements, we talk about those. OSPF, ISIS. OSPF dominates all the enterprise. ISIS dominates ISP. ISIS can run multiple layer three protocols, meaning you can run IPv4 and IPv6 at the same time with one routing protocol. If you're doing OSPF and ISP, you have to run two OSPF processes, OSPF v2 for IPv4, and OSPF v3 for IPv6. You have to deal with two routing tables, configuring two commands for every single port, for every single interface. Everything has to be done twice. When you do ISIS, ISIS doesn't use IP addresses. So for example, to have a routing protocol enabled between two routers, you have to have your layer one up, your layer two up, but also you have to have an IP address that they can ping each other so you can turn on OSPF. In the case of ISIS, you don't need an IP address. You have layer one, layer two, a special addressing from ISIS, and you can exchange whatever runs on top. So ISIS, you're gonna find it in most of the ISPs, because again, you can run anything on top of it. EIERP, the book spends obviously half of the book on EIERP because it's Cisco proprietary. 
The selling point of EIERP is that it's faster than OSPF. There is some truth to that. Remember when we talk about rapid spanning tree? What was the secret sauce in rapid spanning tree? Doesn't hurt you that much to keep the backup report. Learn that information as soon as one dies, the other one turns on. EIGRP is the same system. I'm gonna keep the primary route, but also the backup route. And if the primary route goes away, I don't have to wait for an update. I don't have to wait for anything. I already have the backup pre-configured, turn it on. In this case, in EIGRP is called feasible successor. So it is a combination of distance vector and some of the link states. That's why it's dual, okay? You're still gonna learn how to turn it on, basic manipulation of the routers, of the routes and the metrics. But again, it's vendor specific. We don't spend a lot of clicks there because I don't expect you to be working only for one vendor. Where we talk about loop prevention, split horizon, route poisoning, multiple paths. We talk about picking one picking the first or picking many and do load balancing between them. Two more slides and we're done. Admin distance. What is admin distance? Which protocol is more believable? More believable. Okay, first of all, one thing to point out is this table changes on every vendor. So don't memorize these numbers if you're gonna go and get your CCNA, but if you're gonna go and work for Uniper, these numbers change. Because guess what? Oh, all the protocols that are Cisco specific are the best, okay? Why do we even have a need for admin distance? because admin distance is only usable when a router speaks more than one routing protocol, okay? Like if you're a router on the border of your company, you're gonna learn routes through BGP and you're gonna have learned routes from OSPF. And if both of them tell you we can reach the same network, which one do you believe the most? By default, actually BGP is better prefer over OSPF. So by default, BGP is preferred over OSPF. So if I compromise a router on the internet, I can advertise you a route to your company and suck up all the traffic from your enterprise to my router. So you have heard about you know, hijacking of websites and routes and so on. They just have to manipulate the routing table, advertise it to your routers, and they can black hole all your data from your enterprise. Because by default, the admin distance prefers BGP. Okay? But also, again, you have yourself, you, situations when you have more than one network. You can have a RIP network, an OSPF network, right? And both of them advertise you network X. Which one do you put on your map here? The routing table, can we have one entry for every network from any source? Do you pick the ones from RIP, the ones from OSPF? You cannot do load balancing between a RIP route and an OSPF route because it's apples and oranges. How can you put on the same weight a hot count and a metric of two, or a cost of 100, right? OSPF 100 cannot, doesn't mean anything to RIP 10. 10 routers is not the same as gigabit links on OSPF. So I mean, this is the only parameter that you can have to differentiate one over the other. And you can change these values to your text. It might be that in your organization, RIP is preferred. So you can make RIP look better than OSPF. Can you think about a scenario where you, that, that might become useful? Let's assume this is the end, your corporate network. You have right now, let's assume you have RIP. And suddenly you're entitled, you reach a point where RIP is not longer delivering the performance that you want. How can you upgrade the network? How can you transition all your routers from RIP to OSPF? How will you do this work in the field? If you're a consultant, how do you migrate a network from one flavor of writing protocol to another? But I mean, how can you shut down? How can you upgrade the network without taking the network down? That's the challenge. Like they're running business the whole day, 24 seven, it's a website. 
how can you upgrade the network protocol without taking down the network? So you can run OSPF with an admin distance higher than 120, call it 150. You can turn on OSPF in all the routers. None of the routes are gonna make it into a routing table. Your data is not gonna be affected at all. You're just turning on the application that it talks OSPF with each other. Once you confirm that all, everybody, all the OSPF neighbors talk to each other, that all the information is on the right table, all you have to do is reverse the admin distance and OSPF routes are start getting into the writing table. If something goes wrong, reverse it, put ring back in control. But just remember, this route can have OSPF routes and these guys can have RIP routes. That doesn't matter because the IP packet that shows up in the router only chose, the, all the information the router does for you is on which port do I go out. There's nothing special about using an OSPF map or a read map. All I care is do I go out on that interface or on that interface. At that moment, the job of this router is done. The packet already left. The other guy can use a different map, a different protocol to make the decision. Now I go this way, that's it. There's no need for you to have full continuity of writing protocols end to end. The same way a static route works in your cable modem and the ISP runs BGP. And once that a packet shows up in the data center of your choice, they can run OSPF. Doesn't matter, the writing protocol doesn't matter. It's not an end-to-end -end service. It just provides the information to the routers for them to make a decision where to go out. Typical routing table, what was the source of the protocol? Pay attention to this part. Subnetting is going to be part of your day-to-day -day lives once you get into a routing table role, a service provider. So you know exactly which subnet, which mass are we talking about. Admin distance, metric, who gave you the information? How old is that route? If there's a blackout over the weekend and you show up on Monday and they tell you there were some routes that flapped last night, you can just go and check the age and you know the routes that are more recent. The links that are stable are gonna be up for the last six months, but the links that you actually lost are gonna be like no more than 24 hours old. So you can know exactly which route is causing the problems and which links are causing the problem. Exit interface. How do I reach the next router? So one of the big questions in the midterm written, I'm gonna give you a whole list, a bunch of these together. And your role is to figure out which ones are gonna make it to the routing table. So I'm gonna give you the same route. I can give you that one, the same route from OSPF and another one from RIP. And you need to tell me, well, based on admin distance, OSPF is gonna get in first. Okay? Remember that I mentioned, I made a comment where we talk about sticky on switching, on switches? That we actually use the sticky because there's no guarantee they're gonna be in control over the computer that gets connected there. So just wait for a MAC address. Extended ping allows you to ping from a router on behalf of a computer. So if you manage a router that connects to a switch that connects to multiple computers here, how can we assure that this a user from here can connect to a particular destination network? If you run the ping command on the router, what happens? The source IP address of that ping is that port. So that means these guys can ping each other, but that doesn't mean that these users can actually go all the way to the server. So when you use extended ping, you can actually specify the source IP address. You can ping with that IP address of that port. So basically, it's the same as you having a computer inside of this switch and be able to generate the command from that switch in particular all the way to the server. Again, you're gonna be playing with this for more, for the next three or four laps, so we're gonna have time to go over all the details here. 
That's all I have for today. Questions? No, too long. Already tired. Okay. So again, next week we're going to do that. The quiz, we're going to ask about specifics. About, I mean, I'll send an email with the specifics for the quiz, but it's going to be OSPF, OSPF, DR, BDR selection. I mean, and again, I'm going to let Levi um, cover the Q&A session at the beginning of the next class. A little bit of NAT, PAT, and access list. So again, we'll send a list of very specific topics. I want the quiz more to be an incentive for you to read than punishment, okay? So, I mean, I'll give you the topics, but expect the questions to be addressed directly by the topics themselves, okay? Thank you very much. Have a great week.